in a couple of minutes, so take your seat and get comfortable. Well, we don't want to sink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon. It's now uh, 1.35. So you kind of finished taking your seats. I think I'll just kick us off. Uh, my name is Dan Glass, and I'm a project manager with the Office of Economic Adjustment. I have the uh, distinguished honor of, of introducing and these four guests and chairing this panel, but I also have to acknowledge that this is after lunch, which when I was in kindergarten meant nap time, and so I'm going to try and keep this very riveting and <laughs> fast moving. Uh, a couple of announcements. Uh, OEA is, is taping this, and so at a later point, this will be available on our website. Uh, but in so doing, we ask that when you do ask a question at the end, after all of the presentations, uh, do so in the mic so we can pick it up. Um, and uh, with that, I want to say a few words, and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, this this session is all about moving beyond uh, joint land use study recommendations. And what you're going to hear today is, is kind of a survey of some very successful uh, joint land use study implementation projects that have occurred in, in very different parts of the country. Um, what you should see is also that there were some <coughs> different reasons uh, for the studies in the first place, uh, as well as uh, each of these studies now being kind of different places of their implementation uh, and using a different process. Um, my, my observations on, on joint land use studies and what has made some of these successful are, are few, but I think important, and I'd like you to think about them a little bit as you listen to some of these presentations. Um, the first is that uh, effective military civilian communication and coordination is, is going to be a key that I think you'll see throughout all of these uh, diff different implementation efforts. Uh, many of you may be engaged right now in a joint use study process and are kind of discovering uh, the ways that communication and coordination probably can be used to the benefit of the study and particularly to the recommendations that result from it. Um, and then the second one is really that uh, effective implementation efforts usually have, uh, have or have successfully stricken a balance between successful local economic development and maintaining and conserving the uh, operational environment necessary for the mission to be successful there. Um, and again, that's <coughs> built directly on communication and coordination. So just two things to, to think about uh, as, as uh, we progress through this presentation. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Dr. Charles Coffrin. Uh, Charles Coffrin came to St. Clair County, Illinois in 2005 as a GIS coordinator and has served the county as 911 director and currently GIS manager. Under his leadership, the county was awarded ESRI's Special Achievement in GIS Award in 2009. Previously, he worked as GIS Program Manager and Systems Architect for the U.S. Air Force, Air Mobility Command and Director of the Center for Organizational Research and Development at the Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. So with that, I'm going to tee up this presentation and uh, give the floor to Charles. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? I did take away something from a presentation this morning, and that is I took away a Google app that times my, my, uh, my talking. So I'm going to start it right now. We'll see what happens at the end of 15 minutes. It's kind of hard to summarize what I've been working with and the folks that I've been working with and the land use study that I've been working on for the last five years in 15 minutes, but here it goes. And one other comment before I get started, and that is to move beyond uh, the joint land use study, you really have to know uh, where I came from, my history with joint land use studies, and I guess the perspective that I took into uh, the current effort over at Scott Air Force Base. My uh, 
At AMC, while I was uh, a program manager at AMC, my experience with joint land use began in 2004 with a request from Fort Bragg and Pope Air Force Base to fund a high-speed data connection from state offices in Fayetteville uh, to Fort Bragg and also to the Sand Hills GIS Consortium. You're probably wondering what that's got to do with land use. We did two at AMC, and that's why we didn't fund it. Um, having moved to St. Clair County, my next J. Lewis encounter came on May 19, 2005, when a congressional delegation led by Representative Jerry Costello and featuring the junior senator from Illinois at the time, Barack Obama, announced that Scott Air Force Base would host several new missions and commands as a result of BRAC deliberations. We had to wait several hours for the announcement because the governor of Illinois at that time, Rod Blagojevich, was running late. Uh, <laughs> the mission, so I, I got some face time with uh, Senator Obama. Uh, the mission plus up at Scott focused the importance of land use in the surrounding communities. Realizing the importance of Scott as the home of the Air Mobility Command and also U.S. Transcom and the importance of Scott to the local economy, the county built and continues to support a joint use facility, an airfield and a terminal at Mid-America St. Louis Airport. For the joint use facility to be economically viable and for the county to keep it open, we had to and we continue to have the issue of, of development and trying to find compatible land uses for the, uh, for the joint use uh, facility on the, on the uh, civilian, the commercial side. So having said that, I'd like to kind of give you an overview of our J. Luce study. I'd like to talk a little bit about the phases that we went through and uh, kind of give you an idea of how the, uh, the project itself culminated and then talk a little bit about community uh, sustainment and J. Luce implementation. And again, I see that the folks from Fort Worth are here. I was really impressed by your workshop uh, yesterday. And I think uh, you stole all my thunder because I thought that we were the only ones doing what you had, uh, what you uh, uh, reported on yesterday. So anyway, the purpose and goals of the j -Loose, here are some of the goals that you typically see associated with joint land use studies. In the case of Scott Air Force Base and Mid-America Airport being a civilian facility, there were several other issues that needed to be addressed in our j -Loose. One, the meaning of joint land use or joint use and appropriate land uses around an FAA-controlled airfield and a county-owned facility. Number two, the incorporation of APZ and ACUS guidance and local zoning codes, which would not fade from institutional memory as they had done in the past, either on the civilian or the military side. Three, resolving the ambiguity of ACUS, the ACUS matrix interpretations among five local governments, each looking at that matrix in a different way and for better communication concerning development proposals and incompatibility decisions coming from the base. This kind of gives you an overview, I don't know if you can read it, of our implementation. There were three phases to our j -Loose study. There were, <coughs> after reaching general agreement on basic strategies, the j -Loose technical and policy committees worked to add specificity to the, um, to the mitigation and the encroachment strategies, encroachment reduction strategies. In the end, these strategies were incorporated into zoning ordinances of five local governments. Extending the work now involves creating planning tools for developing a, a sustainable base community, which kind of differs from the old garrison notion of a self-contained, self-sustaining facility. In the first phase, our policy committee endorsed 10 encroachment reduction strategies. The original study culminated with these strategies and it also advanced the view that certain kinds of development, and this is important, certain kinds of development could actually reduce encroachment and keep it from happening around the base. It could also uh, enhance and safeguard the military mission. In the second phase, it was undertaken to implement some of these strategies um, and also these phase one recommendations in government policies and practices. The 30 days or the 90 days after the end of the first phase of the j just didn't give us enough time to implement these strategies. 
So uh, it was deemed desirable to go after a second phase and to strengthen the planning and land use collaboration between Scott and the five local governments. In the third phase, oops. the second phase included that a real or a true implementation can only come about by adopting the recommendations in law. And to do this, two issues needed to be addressed. The first issue was the development of suitable zoning code language to insert into the same zoning ordinances of the five communities. Four of these were municipalities, one was a county government. And the second issue had to do with the assessment of the language itself to make sure that the language that would be inserted into the zoning ordinances would be consistent with state and federal law. Success in the final deliverable of the JLUS would be the successful adoption of the same zoning code by the five local governments, and this was just completed this month. So if you can imagine, if five local governments, four municipalities, one county government, each with different zoning laws, codes, ordinances, and interests, you know, now are sporting the same zoning language concerning land use around Scott Air Force Base and Mid-America Airport. This, to us, was a, just a huge achievement. Let me kind of break down the, uh, the zone, zoning code itself and how we went about developing this. Um, the first, what we did was we, we took a look at the old planning notion of an airport overlay. And what we did was we broke it down by geography into four parts. The first part was the planning influence area, the original JLU study area that serves as an area where if we have a development proposal coming in, there will be increased communication among the five communities and also the Air Force Base. And there's also lighting requirements and regulations that are uh, to be enforced with the, uh, the granting of a permit to build. This represents the A01. If you can see by way of the map, it's the dark area around the Air Force Base um, and around the Air Force, uh, Scott Air Force Base's flight line. You can see that the planning area itself extends also and includes the APZs and some of the noise contours around Mid-America to the east. The east is going this way and the west is that way, so it's that second, uh, that second uh, runway. The second, uh, the second zone was the safety zone, and uh, the runway protection areas are zones around the end of Mid-America Air Force Base, and the accident potential zones and clear zones around Scott Air Force Base were identified as areas that would, um, again, be um, subject to stricter regulations and restrictions concerning development. Um, again, only uh, there aren't any uses that we provide for in the clear zone or the RPZ except for infrastructure, roadways, underground utilities, agriculture, and some passive open space. And the areas that are colored on this particular map show the, the APZs and the RPZs, which are trapezoidal off the end of, once again, Mid-America runway. Uh, Mid-America is, is, is really interesting and, and the crux of the matter here because, once again, it's a civilian airport, but it's used primarily by the military. There was always a question as to whether or not we ought to draw APCs around the end of a FAA-controlled runway. And if we did, that would, that would uh, cause some development issues and questions uh, concerning the, the viability of building low, um, building warehousing around uh, Mid-America for, uh, to support the uh, the commercial end of uh, that particular airport. Airport overlay three, or the, the third area, is a height restriction area. In the height restriction area, what we did was we took the glide slopes of both Mid-America and Scott Air Force Base. Um, we also drew a buffer of 1,500 feet around the installation uh, uh, to protect the uh, 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 military personnel there. And you can see that from this particular slide that the glide slopes in the, uh, uh, the area is quite large. It extends from the tip of one county down to the tip of another. 
Uh, however, as you get further out from the edges of the runways, the restrictions become less. Uh, as, as part of this, uh, this project also, we had the, the contractor that was facilitating the meetings uh, develop a number of tens of three-dimensional models that allow planners to assess uh, height restrictions inside of this area. They could use these, use these models in a GIS to identify where a proposed um, building or structure would poke through a glide slope. And the last, uh, the air, last overlay zone was a noise zone area. Um, this was defined by the noise contours around both Mid-America and Scott Air Force Base. Uh, it does provide for restrictions on residential uses and uses involving hospitals, schools, places of worship as set forward in the ACUS. And again, we, uh, we note that uh, sound attenuation standards would be used in all new construction. And this is what the noise contours around Scott Air Force Base, the field, and also Mid-America look like. Uh, these are using current aircraft that, uh, uh, that fly in and out of Scott Air Force Base and also commercial traffic out of Mid-America. In addition to the use or the development of a consistent set of zoning ordinances that are based on these four zones, we also established a regional advisory board to give planners from the four communities and also the county some support, some collaborative support that, that, that arose from the, the, you know, the ongoing JLUS, uh, to give them support in decisions that were rendered by the, the base concerning development pro proposals and an incompatibility decision. Uh, the board itself consists of uh, one member or one member from each of the communities and also two ex officios, one from Scott and one from Mid-America. And they act in strictly an advisory manner. What, this, what we're trying to do with this re regional advisory board is to keep the collaborative nature of the JLUS going you know, as uh, development proposals come in and as, uh, as decisions concerning <clears throat> these proposals are evaluated by the Air Force. Here are some of the outcomes um, that we see from our JLUS study. Um, I think... Um, The adoption of the airport overlay zones and the zoning uh, ordinances of the five ho hosting communities provide several assurances. Uh, one, the development proposals are tied to geography. Um, in other words, they just don't float in space, they're not ephemeral, they are tied uh, back to the land. Uh, they carry various varying restrictions and these restrictions are based on, again, these four different zones. Uh, development will also remain compatible and the definition of compatible development will continue to be shared by the five local governments and the base in the same way. You know, as base commanders PC us out and as planners come and go, at least we do have in our ordinances and in these four zones an operational definition of what compatible development is. And three, there will be support for evaluating the compatibility of complicated development proposals that may impact the base and the base's mission. Again, this is through this regional advisory board that has been stood up uh, to help planners with, uh, with the assessment of these proposals. Uh, similar uh, JLUS outcomes, I asked, the, I asked Serena and I asked Dan to, to give me uh, an idea of who else is doing the same kind of thing. Um, this is what they came back with. Uh, once again, I, I uh, was really favorably impressed by the work of NAS Fort Worth. I'm going to take a look at their website as soon as I get back. Uh, but again, they, they seem to have gone through the same process and, and have uh, come up with some similar um, directions in terms of planning goals and objectives. And I got to tell you, you know, it, it, it feels, on the, on the one hand, I was disappointed, but on the other hand, I felt good because, gee whiz, you know, I think we're doing, I, we're doing something right here. And I think that you'll find that more and more bases that go through this process are moving toward a definition of uh, uh, sustainability through community integration, rather than an old, uh, the older concept of a gar garrison style mentality where bases were self-sustained and self-contained. And then finally, uh, as in the case of Fort Worth, 
the St. Louis uh, East West Gateway Coordinating Council, which is a tra transportation planning agency, received a $4.6 million grant uh, to develop some planning tools that will, that will further uh, sustainable communities in the region. Uh, Scott Air Force Base and the five communities, because of the work that was done in JLUS and also because of um, the sharing of the, the zoning uh, uh, ordinances, the zoning uh, language in these ordinances, was identified as a community planning area, which means that we'll now be able to take advantage of the best practices, environmentally, transit-oriented development um, planning tools, and also uh, some of the housing tools that they'll be using to, um, to come up with um, um, advances or to come up with proposals for uh, uh, further development, further sustainable development. We're very excited about that. So having said that, I need to show you my favorite plane in the whole world, <laughs> which if you don't know what that is, that's a C-17. Uh, and okay. my screen, by the way, turned red, isn't that great? <laughs> it yeah. it works. Yep, they got an app for that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Charles. Um, load up our next presentation. I um, just wanted to make two quick observations as uh, I was listening to Charles's presentation. Um, two, uh, two lessons that I kind of pulled out of there, and uh, maybe I'll try and do this after each of the presentations, are the, the phased approach that uh, your, uh, your community adopted and also the, dif the difference between the tools and the processes that were used, um, distinguishing between such thing as an overlay zone and, and kind of a process such as a regional advisory board. I think that those proved very effective in, uh, in assisting with the implementation. So with that, let me uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Jim Lee. He is the director, or the, I'm sorry, the deputy planning director of the Fairbanks, Fairbanks North, Star, North Star Borough, Fairbanks, Alaska. Obviously, my Starbucks is not quite kicking in, but give me a couple minutes. I'll help you there. Uh, he returned to Fairbanks North Star Borough Planning Department as their deputy director in September 2009, after over 20 years in Florida as either a planning director or a building director for five local governments. <coughs> he also served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Latvia from 1997 to 1999. Jim holds a Master in Arts degree in Planning and an MBA. He is also a member of the uh, American Institute of Certified Planners. His passions include travel, foreign languages, and learning how to cross-country ski. So, that, please. Thank you, Dan. Uh, I don't have a Google app. I've got a um, Eddie Bauer watch, so we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that works. Um, but I'm sure um, Dan will have the hook if, um, if I run out of time. Um, when I discovered that um, this uh, session was going to be after lunch, on the second day I decided I would try and make uh, this interesting. Um, and and we'll, I will see by the number of people that fall asleep. Um, so what I wanted to, to briefly to talk about was uh, a game, um, JLUS implementation on a fast track, Fairbanks, Alaska. Now this, uh, you have the Northern Lights as the backdrop, which you can see. Yeah, during the winter time um, in Fairbanks. It's very majestic and incredible sight, and I highly recommend it. State of Alaska. Uh, state of Alaska is the um, largest uh, land area state in the Union. Um, and uh, it, the Fairbanks North Star Borough is approximately 190 miles south of the um, uh, Arctic Circle. So that means that our weather varies. It can be two hours of sunlight in the winter and minus 30, minus 40, and in the summer, 20, 21 hours of, of, um, of sun and gorgeous 75 degrees. Yesterday, I need to tell you, it was 75 degrees and low humidity. <laughs> Boy, do I miss home at the moment. Okay, the Fairbanks North Star Borough. 7,361 square miles in central, uh, in, in interior Alaska. Um, we have a road network which leads to Canada as well as uh, to um, Anchorage and uh, to the lower 48. Um, our two incorporated cities are the cities of Fairbanks and the city of North Pole. And as I go through, please follow Santa Claus. Um, we have, the, we have the distinct pleasure of having two military bases 
in the um, borough, Fort Wainwright, and Isleson Air Force Base. If you go along the Richardson Highway, it's 24 miles door-to-door -door between the two bases. Fairbanks welcomes you. It's a friendly place, um, a, lot of, a lot of interesting activity, military, um, oil, and the headquarters of the University of Alaska system. Now this is a Chamber of Commerce chart. You'll, ha you'll have to pardon me about this, but this is in the summer where you see the festivals going on by the Chena River uh, and the clock tower um, and um, people floating down the Chena River. Just to make sure you're all awake and hopefully this will work. <laughs> it gets better. So we have the float plane landing. We actually have float planes landing not downtown. I'm sure that violates FAA rules, but we have it further further down the river. And also our airport, Fairbanks International Airport, is one of the busiest um, small plane airports because I think it's one out of three people in Alaska have pilot's license. So, so. Okay, this is breakup. Not everything is sunny in Fairbanks all, all year round. Um, this is breakup in April or May, again, in downtown um, uh, Fairbanks. Now, I like this shot because it's in downtown Fairbanks and it sort of represents the history of Fairbanks. Fairbanks was um, formed um, in the early 1900s because of gold, uh, the extraction of gold. Um, here you have cabins where they decided as the family increased in size, they didn't worry about the roof lines and so they, did, they expanded um, the, uh, uh, the cabins. And of course, city of North Pole. Santa, where Santa lives. Um, Santa is uh, preparing his list, seeing who's being naughty or nice. And of course, um, Santa's house in the city of North Pole, and you've got to have Santa landing. <laughs> <laughs> so again, there's only one more of these. <laughs> again, everybody's awake? Good, because we're getting into the, uh, the, 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 the nitty gritty of the, the jailer's uh, process of implementation uh, of our recommendations in a few minutes. And then and you saw winter, you saw, you, now you're seeing summer. Um, as, as, as I said earlier, we have two uh, military installations um, in uh, the Fairbanks North Star Borough. First is the Fort Wainwright um, Army Base. Um, it has a, a storied history started in 1935 with, um, with research uh, for planes um, in the Arctic. It is now the home of the first striker combat brigade, which is now deployed to Afghanistan. And the, one of the important things for us is that, that the base has 1.5 million acres of, which provides a variety of training opportunities. Then we go to Isleson Air Force Base, home of the 354th Fighter Wing, or as they call themselves, the Iceman, re Iceman ready to go at minus 50 below. And then you have uh, an F-16. Um, Isleson Air Force Base is also um, very important for training purposes. My understanding is it has the largest uh, fully instrumentally controlled training um, operations in the world of approximately 72,000 acres. So again, for both installations, incredible opportunities uh, for a variety of uh, training opportunities. And then going back and forth to the bases, you see a male moose. This was a couple of weeks ago. Of course, there's a female moose with, it, with um, a couple of calves. And now, uh, the Fairbanks jail is completed in July of 2006. The participants were the people we've just indicated, the borough, which is like a county, city of Fairbanks, city of North Pole, Fort Wainwright, and Isleson Air Force Base. The jail was was um, uh, included 57 recommendations. But the problem at hand was there was no coordinated implementation 
of JLA's recommendations until June 2010. Motivations to implement the JLA's. Again, remember it has sat on the shelf for four years. Military active duty and dependence in the borough represents 20% of our population. The population of the borough is about 98,000 according to the 2010 census. But equally important with that is, and this is the best information I could find, that the direct wages um, associated with the military um, in Fairbanks represents 29% of the wages generated. Now, there are numerous wages that are generated from those wages, but it has a major impact on the borough. Bottom line is the borough would not have the same standard of living without the presence of the military. Now, what motivate, another thing which motivated us to move it along was we got a call from one of our congressional uh, members of, the, of our delegation asking us where we were with implementation of the jailers. Well, it was on the shelf. It was a good product, but it sat there for four years. Um, we have a new borough mayor, and he made it a priority. And the four and five are the goals of the whole jailers program. Um, what I'm going to be talking about th for the remainder is a process for implementation, not so much um, about the uh, uh, zoning changes that are necessary. Is going to be the process. You have in front of you a copy of my presentation. You also have a synopsis of the 57 recommendations. So the top 10, well, the, the, the 10-step process, first of all, was the creation of the Jailers Policy and Technical Committee. I'm sure many of you have um, metropolitan planning organizations. You basically have the Policy Committee, which is the, the politicians, the mayor, senior staff, and potentially representatives from state organizations. And then you have the Technical Committee, which is the worker bees who, who produce the work product. Um, in the audience, we have in the front row, if you could raise your hands, we have Renee Staley, who's on our technical committee. She is representing the Chamber of Commerce on the technical committee. And um, Angela Major, who is with Fort Wainwright, and she is on the um, policy committee. When we created the two committees, we then gave the information, uh, gave the four-year-old study to the military and to the, uh, uh, the borough and basically said, hey, where are we? Is it fully implemented? Is it partially implemented or no implementation at all? Um, that was done before we had any technical or policy committee meetings. Um, and uh, the military had done a very, very good job because a lot of the requirements with planning that are required for uh, military um, organizations. Now, the borough where I work, we hadn't done as good a job. I would always advocate that we have the tougher <coughs> zoning land use controls, but basically the military was far ahead of the borough in the implementation of, of our recommendations. The fifth step, um, this is basically the com technical committee meets to determine uh, which of um, the recommendations were fully Im implemented and what ongoing activities were required. So this might involve the work to actually get them, the recommendations completed, uh, but also indicating what ongoing activities were required. Um, when that happened, the mayor or base commander <coughs> would then, whoever was responsible for that uh, recommendation, would write a letter indicating that what had been done to implement it and what would be done to maintain that implementation. Again, I'm gonna g I'll get into the templates um, at the end of my presentation. Um, along with um, making a determination on each recommendation was the development of three different time frames. So we would basically hope to have everything implemented within five years. We had a six to 12 months, 12 months to 24 months, and starting now and five years. Number eight, the, um, the policy committee uh, reviews and approves the work of the jailers technical committee, and then a letter from the head of the uh, policy committee is, is distributed wi 
uh, to as many people who might be interested. This included local governments, national governments, um, all as many commercial entities as, um, as we could identify. And again, repeat the process. Again, we are repeating the process. We've done our first round of um, implementation of, of, of specific recommendations. Where we are now, um, but the first six months, we moved very fast. We had numerous um, technical committee meetings and um, policy committee meetings, and we implemented within six months 25 or 44 percent of the recommendations. Um, since January of this year, the technical committee is working on implementing another 12 um, uh, recommendations, which will bring us up to 64 percent of the recommendations fully implemented. Now, the, some of the some of these are the low-hanging fruit. Some of them are the easy ones associated with coordination, cooperation. Um, they're not the more difficult ones, at least for the borough standpoint, related to uh, zoning, land use restrictions. And we are um, requesting assistance from the Office of Economic Adjustment to help us um, with that area. And I think it's also equally important um, on number four is that the Jailers Policy Committee and Jailers Technical Committee are, will be ongoing committees. They will be monitoring the um, implementation. They will also, as, as I found out I missed the last technical committee meeting um, because of being in the lower 48, the, the, the technical committee meeting, te technical committee will um, become a committee which is involved in certain recommendations. They will be expanded. For us, it means involved with natural resources, recreational use on military lands. Um, so that we will, that will be ongoing, and so will be the policy committee. And I think the policy committee and the technical committee will also be involved in future updates to the jailer's study, and obviously with that related changes to the, the um, jailer's study. Just a little information, this is uh, the land lease um, program in World War II, which uh, we had the uh, American pilots flying to Fairbanks and then uh, the Soviet pilots flying to the Soviet Union. 8,000 planes were delivered that way. Again, Fairbanks is like anywhere else in America, it's busy downtown. Notice the gas prices. Those were about three weeks ago. We have the highest gas in America, but yet we have a pipeline and we have... <laughs> anyway, you also have the problem of getting across the road. That's the last one on that. Um, and again, in Alaska, incredible because of the wildlife, the cranes, the Canadian geese that are, that are stopping in Fairbanks and going up north to, um, uh, to uh, create their families and then flying back. Um, our cranes go back to um, North Dakota. Sometimes that the cold weather gets really cold. You get tired of it in Fairbanks, so you take a chainsaw to the ice. And of course, boys will be boys. And some of the templates, uh, tables and letters. Again, um, we keep a running count of where we are. Uh, this is good for the press, the technical committee, uh, the policy committee. Um, this represented where we were in December 2010. Um, these are three different time frames. Again, what we do um, is ex uh, we would expand this. Each recommendation has a number, then the content, and then where it is. And then this is our time frames. We've noticed as we start implementing the six to 12 months that we've been able to do some of the long-term um, 24 and 60 month recommendations. So this is an evolving document. Uh, this is the original, this is the letter from, um, from the mayor of Fairbanks North Star Borough indicating that a borough recommendation is implemented and what will be done ongoing status. Again, this commits the head of, uh, of each um, organization. We have the, the base commander for Fort Wainwright and um, I believe the highest civilian employee from Ileson committing to um, keeping the recommendations um, implemented. This puts everybody on notice. And, and lastly is the uh, distribution letter from our mayor who happens to be the chairman of the uh, jailers 
policy committee um, indicating this is the status of where we are and we'll update you. And I, this, again, this went to wide distribution, all our politicians, local, national newspapers. This is a particular cell phone provider. So back to the beauty of Fairbanks, we have the Yukon Quest, uh, which uh, is in February, a thousand miles. It looks cold and it is cold. And of course, the Alaska Pipeline. Again, unfortunately, it's only at one third full, which again makes the presence of the military in um, Fairbanks even more important. Um, this is my favorite. I like um, the, the, the old gold dredge. Uh, the, uh, this was a dredge where uh, they would dredge uh, and then um, get the gold. It was done from 1920 to 1960. And then we actually have active gold mining, which is a little bit more efficient than this, but it's an incredible area to hide. And with that, that concludes my presentation. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. A little clean up. So quickly, uh, two more lessons that I kind of pulled out of your presentation I thought were very interesting. One is, is the importance of timing and political support and uh, implementation. It seems like despite the fact that the uh, study had sat on the shelf for about four years, uh, you found the right moment, <coughs> uh, both in terms of the, the, the military leadership, but also in terms of the political leadership uh, to, to make the, the JLS happen. And also uh, the importance of, of gaining momentum early in the JLS. And so your uh, approach towards going towards the, the low hanging fruit seemed very effective. Um, so with that, let me introduce uh, our next speaker. His name is Ian Crowling. Uh, Ian is the principal planner for uh, Bay County Planning Division in Bay County, Florida. Uh, over the last nine years with the Bay County Planning Division, Ian has helped create and adopt the first ever zoning plan and map for the county and developed the 74,000 acre West Bay Area Sector Plan, focused around the newly opened Northwest Florida Beaches International Airport, new regional employment centers, and the conservation of 30,000 acres. Since 2008, Ian has had a lead role in creating and implementing the joint land use study with Naval Support Activity Panama City. So with that, thank you, Ian. <laughs> I have a cheering section. You lucky guy. I don't, I don't pay them, I promise. Well, thank you, Dan, for the introduction. Um, as you said, my name is Ian Crowling. Uh, I'm a principal planner with the Bay County, Planning, uh, Bay County Planning and Zoning Division of the Bay County Development Services Department. Um, today I want to try and talk to you just a little bit about Bay County, let you know where it is, uh, what our issues are there, uh, talk to you about um, our Navy base, Naval Support Activity Panama City, um, their issues. Uh, also talk to you about our joint land use study, the process, how we got into it, um, how we got through it, and then our, um, the, the main part of the presentation is the progress we've made in our implementation. Um, to start off, where are we? We are in the northwest portion of Florida. Uh, people don't know that that portion of Florida exists, but it does, and it's up there. Uh, you can zoom in here in northwest Florida, you'll see Bay County there in the red. Um, I've got a laser pointer here. For those of you that are unfamiliar with Northwest Florida, you'll see uh, Escambia County, Pensacola is located there, uh, Okaloosa, Walton County, Destin, Sandusky in that area. Uh, Bay County is home to uh, Panama City Beach. We've got 27 miles of coastline. Most of it looks like that. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, 270 square miles of water in Bay County. Those basically make up the bays that are inside Bay County. Uh, 320 days of sunshine, um, much like the national media would like you to know, last year the uh, BP oil spill did not make the beach look like that. Um, it, we didn't get any oil. Uh, of course, it did hurt our economy. Uh, tourism is a big industry there. Uh, 14,000 local jobs, 1.5 billion. We have two military bases there in Bay County, uh, Tyndall Air Force Base and Naval Support Activity Panama City combined to provide about 9,000 jobs to the area. Again, no oil, so come visit, please. Uh, <laughs> Northwest Florida has several military installations, just wanted to show you. Um, we've got NAS Pensacola there in Escambia <coughs> County. This giant blob is Eglin Air Force Base. Uh, there you'll see Tyndall Air Force Base, which I just talked about. And this tiny little blip on the radar screen is the naval base that we'll be talking about. Um, this is zoomed into Bay County, you can see again, Tyndall Air Force Base takes up about 9,300 acres, whereas um, NSA Panama City takes up about 660 acres. Uh, just a brief history on Bay County. 
As far as their population goes, currently we're about 170,000. Uh, the two major cities in Bay County are Panama City and Panama City Beach. Panama City here in the blue and the beach there in the green. Uh, the white area is the unincorporated area. That's the portion that uh, my office works with. You'll see, again, there's uh, NSA Panama City. Um, we border it right there. Kind of zoom in, give you a better idea. There's about four or five other small uh, incorporated cities there, mainly to the east. Uh, Naval Support Activity Panama City. Tell you a little bit uh, about them. I told you that they're about 660 acres. They host 13 tenant commands. They are the premier dive training and littoral warfare center uh, for all branches of the U.S. military. Um, the waters in and around the area, and I'll show you those waters, uh, provide rough and calm water training that is crucial to their mission, uh, which thus makes it crucial to Bay County and uh, hopefully us helping su support their mission there. They also have uh, LCAC missions, uh, helicopter missions. Major tenant commands, the largest is Naval uh, Surface Warfare Center. They do RDTE and e on mines, mine warfare, underseas countermeasures, and uh, do all types of different optics, robotics, and acoustics. They do some amazing work there. Uh, Naval Experiment, Experimental Diving Unit, they have 120 working personnel. They work with explosive ordinances, disposal, diving, medicine, uh, saturation diving. And then, of course, the Naval Diving and Salvage Center. They train all the U.S. military divers. Uh, they teach submarine rescue, underwater construction. They have 300 students at a time, and they work through about 1,600 every year. There's a better kind of zoomed in area where you can see the orange here is the base. There's Panama City. There's Panama City Beach. And here's the unincorporated area. And of course, here's the water area, the bay. Um, they're training areas. They've got nine training areas uh, inside the bays. You'll see them here. And one out in the Gulf. Um, if you zoom in there, you can see the swimming tracks where they train. Um, they, they do more than just swim out there. They do all types of different missions. Um, but you can see in this area here, in this area, it's, it's really been parcelized. That's just our Bay County parcel map. Most of that area is residential. Um, here on Thomas Drive is commercial. But uh, it's mostly residential homes, condominiums. Uh, people like to live here because one, like I showed you the picture, it's a beautiful area. It's also got um, a great area to go boating. There's a shell island there. A lot of people go out to every weekend. A uh, great place to fish. So. Tons of people have boats, um, jet skis. It's very popular. They've had this for a while, and they've always had a great relationship with the Navy base. Of course, in 2006, the Navy calls Bay County up and says, hey, what's going on? You'll see this red area here. I'll, I'll put it back up there for you. They said, what's going on? We've got a proposal in here for a dock that's going right into our training area. So we didn't know what they were talking about. Well, it ends up there's, there's a proposed development of a 620-foot-long pier with nine boat slips at the end of it. So you can see this is their training area right here. You can see how you know one of these new mini marinas out here could possibly create problems for their mission. Um, like I said, they have 10 nearshore open water training areas. Uh, this AP1 training area, this area I just showed you, um, is 2,000 yards, swimming insertion area, and nearby recompression chamber. That's in case anyone gets sick. Um, the problem is that the county only issues, or at least the planning department, only reviews the developments that are attached to the docks. Docks and piers are not submitted on our plans for our review. Uh, the DEP, Florida DEP, permits the docks and the piers, and the Army Corps of Engineers assists in the permitting process when they deal with navigable waterways. Luckily, they're the ones that alerted the Navy to it. The Navy was able to comment, and we started to work on it. Basically, the Navy's concern was any proposed structure within 100 feet of these training areas is a serious safety concern for both their personnel and for the general public. Um, the county looked at it. It's a policy question. You know, if we start allowing uh, these kind of mini marinas, large docks and piers in these areas, uh, it could lead to similar future structures adjacent to these training areas, and uh, it could really pose a problem for the future of the Navy training base. Luckily, the economy tanked, and the pier was never constructed. Uh, there were also some design problems. But immediately after that, the Navy, uh, it, it kind of perked up everyone's ears. The Navy worked immediately to get the training areas designated in the U.S. Navy restricted areas. This is going to help uh, both the military and the general public. Um, we agreed with them that this could still issue, uh, could still pose problems in the future. 
So they spoke with DOD and OEA, and they approached uh, Bay County, since we were the one neighboring the base, and this was our development, that we should start working on a joint land use study. Uh, joint land use study was approved, we were approved by OEA for funding in 2008. We started in December of that year. We finished it in 2009. Again, if you saw those maps, uh, we were Bay County. We partnered with Panama City and Panama City Beach. Uh, the policy committee was made up of one of our county commissioners. We have a county commission form of government. Both Panama City and Panama City Beach have a uh, mayor city council form. So both mayors of Panama City and Panama City Beach agreed to serve on that uh, policy committee. We also had the base commander from NSAPC, and we also had a, a a leader from one of the support lobbying groups there called the Bay Defense Alliance. Our technical committee was made up of city planners, transportation planners, uh, staff from the state agencies of DEP and the Department of Community Affairs, uh, of course, Navy staff and officials from the Port of Panama City. Our visioning process focused on 24 factors. Uh, of course, we talked about safety with the docks problem, and we talked about land use and compatibility, frequency spectrum, of course, our inter interagency coordination and public trespassing. So what did we come up with? Well, our final report had an information brochure to help people realize, one, that there was a Navy base in town. Like I showed you, it's so small. Um, it's kind of fenced on, on the side there. Thomas Drive, uh, there are many people in the county that don't even know we have a Navy base in town. They know about the large Air Force base. So it's a, let them know that, hey, uh, there's a Navy base there. They do training. They're vital to the area. Um, their brochure also talked about the joint land use study, the process it was going through. Uh, we got some great shape files from GIS uh, maps, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, this final report was a set of 51 recommended strategies. Now, 51 is a lot. And when you start looking at it, you realize you can't really tackle them all at one time. Um, we took about 13 or 14, and I'll tr try and go through them with you. But those 13 or 14, when you start looking at how many they are, we're talking about just in general, uh, a military influence overlay district. We're talking about three different influence areas focusing on anti-terrorism force protection, on land use water interface, and on frequency. You're talking about security zones for anti-terrorism force protection, security zones for microwave line of sight. We're talking about a communication plan, um, possibly a new business registration program to uh, sort out the frequency issues, and also, of course, the docks and the piers problem. So that's certainly a mouthful. If you brought all that to the commission or to the implementation committee or to any political leader uh, with a set of what, five different areas and seven different regulations, um, we found or we thought that that would just confuse the heck out of them. So what we did is we tried to divide it up into um, three different phases. Uh, we'd like to take the momentum we had from adopting our joint land use study in, 2000, in November of 2009. And what we did was we adopted the military influence overlay district which I'll show you in a second, uh, immediately into our comprehensive plan. Um, I'll talk about the three phases that we've broken our implementation uh, program up into. Uh, we've just completed the first phase of implementation. This talks about uh, line of sight, anti-terrorism, force protection, and communication pathway corridor height limitations. Uh, we took those to the Planning Commission just, in, uh, just last Thursday, and they were passed unanimously. Our second phase, we started in April of this year. This is focusing on a communication plan uh, for zoning structures and water, again, those piers and docks, and a, a business registration program. And we're working, uh, hopefully, at the end of the summer to start a third phase of implementation. This will focus on possible design standards for parcels adjacent to the base, uh, real estate disclosure program, and possibly a uh, memorandum of understanding for frequency ordinances. So the first of these 13 issues was, uh, you know, establish an implementation committee. Uh, the policy committee, I told you, was made up of the mayors and uh, our county commissioner, base commander. They agreed to continue to serve as the implementation committee. Uh, that was good. They had the momentum. They had the desire. They knew that the county and the cities were working towards uh, not only this joint land use study finishing, but also trying to implement and uh, preserve the mission of the base. Like I said, the first thing we did was uh, wanted to adopt the military influence overlay district. Uh, we adopted that. In, December of 2010. This basically provides a really general outline, uh, providing notification to the Navy base for new developments within it, and uh, the start of creating regulations to protect the missions. Uh, inside that MIOD are going to be three military influence areas. Uh, we adopted those maps also into the comprehensive plan. 
that we adopted these maps into the plan with just some very general knowledge or general information on what would happen once we start getting uh, development in, the, in these areas. The reason why we did that again is we, if, if we start throwing out too many uh, regulations and maps at the same time, we thought we would definitely confuse the public and certainly the politicians. Again, here's your military influence overlay map. You'll see again, familiar, there's the base. These are the training areas I talked to you about. Um, they have a microwave tower that they communicate with Eglin Air Force Base and with Tyndall. So basically, uh, the regulations we're going to be talking about and adopting in the future are going to be falling within this area uh, that falls within Bay County, Panama City Beach, and Panama City. These uh, three military influence areas, I told you we adopted them in 2010. Uh, the city of Panama City and Panama City Beach are basically going to follow our lead and adopt those this year. Uh, the thing we've adopted just this past Thursday, this is a land use military influence area. This is going to be focused on line of sight into the base and of course the microwave signal line of sight going out of the base. Um, the main idea we wanted to do was evaluate the area in, uh, around the base. Um, we have zoning in Bay County. We just adopted it in 2004. Before that, you could build anything you wanted as high as you wanted next to anything you wanted. And it was, uh, it was a tall task to adopt this zoning ordinance. So you got zoning. Everyone's kind of uh, on the edge of their seats about building heights. And now, of course, our idea is to go and try and limit building heights again. But what we've tried to do is uh, create as a possible incentive uh, by offering incentives to developers uh, possibly new structures inside of these uh, ATFP goals. Basically, what we thought about doing was, I'll go back one slide. Um, we have floor area ratios. We have impervious surface ratios for all lands inside Bay County. Uh, for these areas that we're trying to limit the height in and around the base, uh, we proposed basically increasing those areas, increasing the floor area ratio, increasing the impervious surface ratio. Basically, they can uh, allow additional site coverage create a larger bulk of a building rather than the height of a building. Um, this is from our joint land use study. You can see we talked about NSA Panama City. We talked about three different buffers, each 1,000 feet long, 160 feet, one 160, and one 300. Uh, the tallest building you can build in Bay County with all the condos is 230 feet, so we just cap that off at 230 feet. Uh, this is the map. Again, you see the installation and the three zones. You're talking about 60 feet here, 160, and 300. I'm sorry, 230. Uh, I talked to you about the microwave path uh, line of sight. Again, this is where their uh, tower is. They communicate down here on the base, uh, on the past the lagoon here, so they can communicate with their operations in the Gulf. And they also communicate um, uh, west going to Eglin and east going back to Tyndall. Um, basically, we the lucky thing with this is. I think the height at the tower that they transmit is over the maximum building height of what we allow. So we didn't have to uh, worry about that too much. As far as the second phase, what we're working on now, we talked about uh, basically creating uh, a zoning ordinance for structures in the water. Um, I don't know if we will actually create design standards, but we'll certainly create a new policy in which uh, they would come to the, 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 if they would fall inside these areas, uh, they would come to the county and we would route that to NSA, Panama City for their review and approval. Uh, this is the land use water interface I was talking about. Basically, any new docks, piers, uh, boat entrances um, into the into the bays there in those green areas would uh, would eventually be routed uh, to our office for our review. And if there were any concerns, we would bring that to the Navy. Um, we're looking at ad adopting possible design standards for properties adjacent to the base. Um, there are some areas there around the base, like I said, there are commercial residential areas where uh, to try and get above the floodplains, people have put in so much fill that the, uh, the base has a fence around it, but they've got so much fill that basically the, the ground floor of, of their development is almost on level with the top of the fence there at the Navy base. So we talked about possibly uh, putting in restrictions for perimeter walls, uh, development phasing, and uh, additional setbacks. Our third phase of implementation, again, the county doesn't have a business license. Panama City has a business license. Uh, the county does not. There's political support to probably put one in. I think it'll end up being countywide, 
but we thought, well, if we're going to make a business license countywide, um, perhaps we can uh, put in this military influence overlay district for frequencies, uh, any businesses that come in that uh, are going to be in these areas, and I'll show you the map, in these areas, basically uh, they can report to us what frequencies they plan on using. And again, we haven't developed that language yet, but eventually uh, I think we'd, we'd have a list of, of anything that we think might be a problem, we would obviously try and route to the new phase. Um, also in the third phase, talking about possible real estate disclosures, and um, of course then uh, working on this frequency military influence area. Uh, last but not least, uh, talked about easements on top of parcels as far as these line of sites, uh, line of sight corridors. Basically, in conclusion, um, I hope you've learned a little bit about Bay County, where we are, what we're doing, and about the great stuff Naval Support Activity Panama City's been doing. Um, for us, it really worked well to have a firm time frame for our joint land use study. Uh, we got it done in about 11 months, and right away we were adopting things into our comprehensive plan to kind of help the public and especially the politicians see that this wasn't just a 200-page booklet. This was something that uh, we valued and we wanted to implement. Um, through that joint land use study process, we have a great relationship with uh, Office of Economic Adjustment, and we've really formed good relationships with uh, the base and the base commander. And for us, it's really been good to break these up into three different phases. Um, we thought about even adding a fourth phase just to make it easier for everyone to, to focus on. And really, uh, when you're working with people on implementing these different tasks, you, you have to, at least for us, you're dealing with so many different uh, zones and heights that it, fo it really works to focus on one at a time. Um, with that, I thank you. Um, I will say, I heard this morning the Admiral talk about how the Navy attacks a problem, and they said specifically, um, hold on, I've got it here. How the attack a problem is building a network having a plan, and then making it happen. Well, we feel like we've definitely built a network. We've got great relationships with the community, with the Navy, and with OEA. Uh, we have a plan. We have a good joint land use study. It's got recommendations in there that are specific. We're working on them. And um, as you can see, we're definitely trying to make it happen. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, one quick lesson I pulled out of that that I thought was very uh, uh, important is the, uh, the importance of the composition of the policy committee and the implementation committee, uh, and particularly the leadership of those members and what they show in terms of the, uh, the community. Um, I have a little experience with the Panama City jails, and I can say that there were two in particular the uh, influential uh, leaders on that, uh, Mike Thomas, who's a county commissioner, and the, the commander of the uh, Naval Support Activity, uh, both very, very uh, eloquent in their uh, communication and coordination, and that served the benefit of the committee and of the overall effort very well. Um, our fourth speaker is Courtney Alvarez. She is the city attorney with the city of Kingsville, Texas. Uh, Courtney Alvarez has been employed with the city of Kingsville for 11 years. She interned with the Texas Supreme Court, Justice Jack Hightower in 1994, prior to graduating from South Texas College of Law in 1995. She worked at an insurance defense firm and at the Cleburne County Attorney's Office prior to her employment with the city. She is currently a board member of the Texas Coalition for Affordable Power. Courtney? Well, it's certainly an honor and a privilege to be here speaking before you today, and it certainly um, wouldn't be here without a little bit of um, good luck and blessing. The city of Kingsville, um, is a rural, uh, it's in a rural area, we're only about 25,000 in population. And if we hadn't had uh, a close uh, coordination and communication between the city and the county, um, between the OEA and between the base, I don't think that uh, I would certainly be here before you today. So it's nice to see a common thread, I think, in all of the speeches and the presentations that we've been at today because it really, it really is key to have good coordination and good communication. Um, as an attorney, I'm obviously going to touch on the law, so there's not going to be a lot of pretty photos or, or things like that to keep you entertained, but hopefully I'll try and weave in a little bit of our personal experience and well, um, and then maybe when we get closer towards the end, um, I, 
had a new word, a takeaway. I'll have some takeaways for you at the end of the presentation. Uh, the city of Kingsville is located in the coastal bend of South Texas, as you can see, and we're just 40 miles southwest of Corpus Christi. Uh, we're the little red dot at the bottom there, and uh, we're the proud home of Naval Air Station Kingsville. Now, as you can see, we train tactical naval and marine jet pilots, and we've been doing that since July 4th of 1942. The kind of the overview of uh, where we came from and where we are. We had a meeting with the base because we had some good communication going on with them back in 2005, and the commander at the time, um, Jim Kraft, said, hey, we've uh, decided that we have such great um, flight facilities here, the airspace is wonderful, and while the city is growing, we want to make sure we don't have a problem in the future. And so I've submitted the Kingsville for a consideration for a joint land use study, and that was the first time we'd ever heard the word, and that was back in 05. Well, we were fortunate enough to be um, selected for the program, and we started the process in 06. And like some of um, the communities that might be out there now, we had some changes in staff with regard to the planning director. And so it might have taken us a little bit longer um, than others to get our JLUS done. But we were able to get it completed, and we got the city commission to approve it back in 08. And because there was such um, an enthusiasm or a momentum, um, both within the city and the county and the staff, for the things that came up, in the joint land use study, um, the city manager and I, because at that time, again, we were without a planning director, uh, worked on the JLS implementation grant. So I'm not sure what phase you might be um, in your community with regard to that, but it's something that I suggest you strongly consider doing. Um, it certainly helped out for a community of our size. As you can imagine, um, the base is a very important economic driver in the community and not just within Kingsville but within the surrounding area and I don't know without um, the OEA's uh, implementation grant if we would have been as successful in implementing all the things like Ian had mentioned that are in that little book that you come out of uh, when you have your JLS finally done but um, we went ahead we got the Joint Airport Zoning Board created we got the board to approve some regulations and most recently, we got some lighting regulations done. Now, now that you see kind of what the overview is, I'll give you some information as to how or why that might be important. Our Naval Air Station is located just outside the eastern city limits, and so a portion of the base is within our city's ETJ. So that's an area that the city has some ability still to regulate zoning and land use. But most of the base lies uh, outside of the city limits and outside of our ETJ within the county. And so you might say, well, you know, why is that important? Because with Ian's presentation, the county has the ability, mercifully, um, to do a lot of land use uh, regulations and comprehensive land use regulations. However, <laughs> I'm in Texas. And Texas, unfortunately, is one of the, well, it's very fortunate in most parts, but in this aspect, um, it's one of the few states that has little to no comprehensive land use and um, development regulatory authority for counties. Now, if you're in a bigger um, area, say around the Dallas Houston Metroplex, um, if you're in one of those spots, you're generally okay because the legislature's decided <coughs> they're big enough, we're going to give those counties and those areas some specific authority. But for the rest of us, uh, there's very little authority at all with regard to regulating land use outside of incorporated city limits. Uh, as you can see, there's lots of military facilities in Texas, and so that kind of um, creates a problem, as you might see, with regard to how um, not being able to regulate the zoning and land use compa compatibility issues. Um, you might check when you get back, and this is one of the takeaways I kind of had towards the end, uh, with whoever your local governing uh, body's attorney is, maybe the city attorney or the <coughs> county attorney that you work with, just to verify what kind of land use regulatory authority that that particular body has in your particular state, and then also check to see what authority exactly do they have. Because a lot of times people think they know what can and can't be done, but it's really interesting once you start diving into the statutes of your particular state, what you're able to find. And that's kind of where we were. <laughs> it's
Texas uh, legislators, thankfully, had realized the importance of having some type of compatible land use around airports in the state. And they were um, fortunate enough to not specify it specifically for military installations, but for civilian installations as well. Because they all essentially have, as you might expect, some of the same uh, land use compatibility issues. They adopted Chapter 241 of the Texas Local Government Code, and that's one of the few sites um, that I have in the presentation, but that way, if you want to take it back at a later point in time and look to see how whatever your particular state might have compares um, with what Texas might have, and if there might be some things there that might be useful for you, um, then you can certainly use it as a source. Now, under Chapter 241, a political subdivision, such as the city I work for or the county that I live in, could decide that they want to adopt, administer, and enforce uh, airport hazard in an airport hazard area certain types of zoning regulations. And, and you can see what that is, but essentially they defined in the statute an airport hazard as a structure or an object of natural growth that obstructs the airspace that's required, and that's for takeoffs, landings, things like that, or that interferes with the visual radar, uh, radar radio or other systems for tracking and acquiring data basically for new landings and takeoffs. Now there's really two different types of categories of things that they can regulate with regard to air zoning regulations. You have the uh, airport hazard area zoning regulations or you have your airport compatible land use regulations. Let's say essentially what can be regulated. Well once you have this hazard area identified, you divide it into zones, and then we have the ability um, out in the county now to do things that a city could do. You can specify the land use that's permitted for that area or within that zone. Uh, you can regulate the types of structures that would go there, and you can restrict the height. Now, everybody kind of already knows what compatible land use is, but I went ahead and took the statutory definition just in case perhaps it's a little broader than what you might find in your own state statute. Um, hopefully it's not more restrictive, but I think they did a fairly good job in, um, in keeping it broad enough that it could co cover just about every type of conceivable thing <laughs> that might come up and possibly interfere uh, with the operations of an airport. And you're wondering how far do these regulations actually extend? Well, um, essentially you have your runway and then there's a rectangle around your runway. And so for the sides of your runway, you can go out one and a half statutory miles from the center line of your runway. And with regards to the ends of the runway, you can go out five miles, five statute miles from the end of the paved surface. And so you end up with this nice long rectangle uh, around your runway. And uh, it sounds like a lot of space and practice um, you might find that there are certain types of things that can come up, such as wind farms, which fall beyond that five mile or the one and a half mile radius. And so that's why I say if there's, there's things that you think that you can do or regulate within your own counties, you might want to go back and just double check, do some communication, do some coordination, and um, make sure that you're going to be able to guarantee both yourself and the installations that you work with that you can protect them. And you wonder, who makes the rules? Uh, well, the governing body where the airport is located or the um, a local governing body where a um, defense agency has a, an airport located where there might be compatible land use issues, they can do one of two things. Either the local governing body where the airport is located can just say, we're going to regulate this, we're going to create our own board, we got everything covered. Or in a situation like ours, the county, and in perhaps in yours as well, the county doesn't have as much of a, um, a support group perhaps as the city does. They may not be as organized, they're not used to dealing with land use issues, they may not have regulatory boards um, that they could delegate this to. And so they say, well, city, Y'all have got the boards in place. You're used to dealing with land use issues. And you certainly have, um, based on part of the base being within your ETJ, a control compatible land use area. 
next to NAS Kingsville. So we want to do a joint partnership with you. We want to do a joint airport zoning board, which is also allowed under the statute. And we want to have that board be responsible for creating these regulations that are going to help protect the land use and the mission of the base. Now the joint airport zoning board, um, if one is done as opposed to the local governing body doing it themselves, has the same power to adopt, administer, and enforce these airport hazard area zoning regulations or the airport uh, compatible land use zoning regulations. The same power as a political subdivision. And uh, you don't find that very often. In Texas, it's a five member board for a joint airport zoning board. Each of the political subdivisions would appoint two people via a resolution to serve on this board. And then once the four uh, board members meet, then they amongst themselves select a fifth person who will serve as the chairman. And you wonder how are regulations adopted? Well, um, you know, there's always due process. That's a beautiful thing about our country. And so we're going to have, obviously, some hearings before we adopt any rules. And prior to having hearings, what do you normally have to do? You have to give the public notice. So you have to publish in a newspaper of general circulation in each of the political subdivisions uh, where the area to be zoned is located at least 15 days prior to the first hearing. And you don't really have to have more than one hearing unless you're going to be adopting you know, regulations at different points um, in time. But you do have to have a hearing and notice of the hearing prior to each adopted set of regulations. And then they say, well, if you have regulations now, there always has to be an enforcement mechanism. And so the statute does provide for an administrative agency to do the enforcement. And um, they kind of left a lot of latitude, thankfully, so that the agency, as you can see, can be created by the regulations or it can be an existing official border agency of the political subdivision that adopted the airport um, zoning regulations, or it could be an existing um, official board or agency of a political subdivision that participated in the creation of the joint airport board uh, zoning board adopting the regulations. So in our situation, as I had indicated earlier, the city was the one that was better structured and suited to deal with handling this and so the county didn't have any problems uh, saying, city, why don't you go ahead and let your zoning, <laughs> why don't you go ahead and let your zoning boards um, help deal with the administration of this particular uh, matter. And then we're going to go ahead and also, because if you have regulations and you have people applying for permits and applications and things, there's not always going to be a seeing of an eye to eye between the agency that's either granting or denying the permit and the applicant, you've got to have a right to appeal. And so who gets to hear the appeal? The Board of Adjustment. The city already had a Zoning Board of Adjustment, and so it made sense um, for us to take on that responsibility as well. Now it does say that you can go ahead and create a Board of Adjustment. Uh, one of the things that was on the prior slide is because the Board of Adjustment hears um, all of the appeals for applications on uh, things that are within this controlled area, that no member of the Zoning Board of Adjustment can be actually on the administrative agency, and also um, this board can't do the other board's job. Appeals from the Zoning Board of Adjustment are heard in court. Now, if there's a conflict in the regulations, as sometimes occurs, um, it's not a perfect world, obviously, and there have a conflict between the airport hazard zoning regulations and some other regulation, then you look to see which one's the more stringent, which is the strictest, and then that would be the one to control. And then if you have a conflict between your created uh, airport compatible land use zoning regulations and some other uh, rule or regulation, then the statute says that the airport compatible land use zoning regulations are going to control. And that's really, really helpful. And there's uh, miscellaneous provisions. It's a, a fairly interesting statute, and it talks about other things that you can do, like error rights, abogation easements, um, and other things like that. But how did it really get put into practice in Kingsville? As I had alluded to earlier, the, the city actually approached the county about this, but we worked together uh, to form a joint airport zoning board. 
It was one of the things that came out of our JLS. And so when we got to the implementation phase of our joint land use study implementation project, uh, we were able to work with uh, our project manager and we were also able to work with a really good consultant and he helped us develop some regulations for this board, a draft set of regulations for them to consider. And it was um, immensely helpful. And like I said, without all of um, everyone's assistance, we certainly wouldn't have been able to do it internally on our own or you know, just with the city and the county working together. We did the resolutions, we got the board appointed, had our public hearings after we had our notice and they adopted a set of regulations. Now the first set of regulations um, that they adopted were just the general, you know, broad zoning and compatible land use things. This is actually a map, the only one I have, um, that will show you kind of those uh, rectangles that I was talking about that go around the airstrips because we have two runways um, in Kingsville, uh, the north and south and the east and west. And you might be wondering why part of the uh, east-west runway has not a full rectangle and that's because the red line there that goes around that's the city limits for the city of Kingsville and we have sufficient um, controls in place with regard to land use and zoning within that area and can actually do a little bit more um, than the joint airport zoning board could within that area so we went ahead and when we were doing our study we just carved that area out and kept that within the city's domain or jurisdiction so that way we wouldn't also get into kind of any territorial disputes on things. And it seemed to work out um, pretty well for us uh, so far. We had um, another set of um, uh, recommendations that we implemented and that was just done in January of this year. We did the notice, uh, we had the public hearing and at the last minute um, the planning director thought, hey, you know what? That'll be a really neat idea. I'm gonna send out postcards to all of the property owners that are within uh, 200 feet of this area that we're looking to put in these lighting regulations for. Now, it wasn't anything that the statute required. Um, it was just something that you know he thought would be cool and helpful and beneficial. And, and lo and behold, we actually had some people show up for this one. Um, somebody other than the King Ranch showed up for the meeting and they had some questions or concerns, but it was interesting, most of their questions or concerns were not so much about the lighting regulations themselves, uh, but since Texas is a strong property rights state, you know, how in the world could this board, which none of them were on, tell them what they could or couldn't do with their land? You know, and it, being the city attorney, I deal with all kinds of nuisance violations too, and so if you've got a junk vehicle on your property or, you know, an unsightly structure, we still have the authority to go in there and tell you even though it's on your land, you know, you gotta get rid of it. And so people in town are under that misconception that if it's my land, I can do what I want, um, but that's not the case. So if you're out in the county, there's an even stronger perception, at least in Texas, that you can do what you want with your land and you can't tell me otherwise. And so it was a really eye-opening experience, um, I think for them, but once it was, you know, all said, done, and explained, no one got up and said anything negative against the base um, or really against the regulations themselves. They were all very um, pro-military. It was just getting them to understand the process and uh, how it works. And I see I'm running out of time, so I'll go back to my takeaways. One, verify, preferably with an attorney, the land use regulatory authority that is in your area. Who has it and what do they really have? Uh, secondly, going along with communication and coordination, meet with similarly situated entities in your state. You know, if there's other bases, no matter what type of base uh, they might be, you'll be surprised to find out some of the common issues that you will all have, and if you can work on building relationships with them, and you can identify common areas of concern, your base, their base, and the entire state will benefit from that dialogue. And thirdly, work with your state legislators to craft legislation. And if you can, start about a year before the next legislative session if possible, because if you can get 
your legislators and the other people with the other bases all have the same end result in mind and they can get their state representatives and state senators all working towards uh, this common goal, this one piece of legislation, then it can be a much more effective than you thinking, you know, I'm down in South Texas and I'm the only one with this problem in the state and, you know, we don't have a lot of, um, I guess, political power or clout behind us, but if San Antonio and El Paso and Fort Worth and other areas in the state are facing similar situations, that brings a lot more to the table and it opens up a lot more legislators' eyes, which is increases um, the effectiveness of what you're trying to do. So if you communicate and coordinate, then obviously you will increase your chance of success. And uh, one of the other things that I was just gonna throw in real quick is that I doubt our JLIS would have been as successful without the implementation. It kept us focused and not just the city and the county focused um, because it made sure that we got our boards created, we got our regulations adopted, but it also kept the consultant focused by making sure we were checking off the things on our to-do list. And last but not least, it even helped keep the military focused because if we hadn't had the deadlines, we might not have gotten those bash brochures from them in time and gotten some other things done as well. And I certainly want to thank you for your attention and um, I'm done. We've been kind of close on time, so I want to see if anyone has any questions and invite you up to a microphone to uh, address your question to uh, one of the speakers today. Hi, Jim Eichen from uh, Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. And I'd appreciate any thoughts you have on, on um, the impression that I have to give you on, on some of, of what you all three of you just said. Um, I think um, uh, while in some ways all three of you probably think that your communities are, are urban in only the strictest legal sense, um, I heard a lot of discussion on zoning up here. And we're, we're uh, in the process of, of just starting a joint land use study with White Sands Missile Base and Fort Bliss. And we've had discussions on this at the action officer level now and we'll be discussing it more. But if any part of the discussion we're going to be having in New Mexico on this issue even once uses the word zoning, we are doomed to failure. <laughs> um, we're going to have to find a new language to, to do this in terms of you know, land use recommendations or um, compatible use. Uh, I mean, all the other euphemisms for what we do because if any rancher or large landowner in the area gets a hint of the word zoning, um, all, co all efforts at cooperation are, are probably done for us. <laughs> well, one of the things we did when we adopted our Joint Airport Zoning Board regulations is we did that. We called them regulations instead of a zoning ordinance or, or something of that nature. And, and it seemed to help both the King Ranch, who um, some of you might be aware of is one of the largest landholders in the area and they have the majority of land around NAS Kingsville uh, which is beneficial but we made sure that we coordinated uh, with the ranch we had them on our technical committee we had them on the joint land use implementation committee and like you said you have to find the right term or phraseology that that kind of makes everybody comfortable and is as least offensive as possible um. From the Fairbanks North Star Borough perspective, I think, uh, again, we have uh, similar uh, zoning uh, is communism is socialism aspect, um, but the borough does have um, zoning authority. But I do think when we get into the um, implementation and the protection um, of encroachment to the bases, we're going to have to look at a variety of other things besides zoning. One of the issues that we'll be looking at is that um, the, the law has changed that now when a base um, destroys a wetland, it has to mitigate one to three. Currently, um, they can um, pay money to uh, put in a, um, uh, a hazard bank that may be hundreds of miles away. But I think that that's one issue that you could look at um, uh, a number of options. One, as I said, is, is, is um, purchase of land adjacent to bases for 
uh, mitigation for um, wetlands. You've also got uh, tax issues, um, reduction of, of, of taxes. Um, I'm not sure we're sophisticated enough for transfer of development rights. Again, I think from, from the Fairbanks aspect, we're going to have to look at a multitude of different things, conservation easements, the purchase of conservation easements, um, a number of other issues that the borough can work with the military about in a declining revenue um, opportunities. But I would agree that zoning, and I know from my standpoint of, of, of working on the program and developing the program, I'm going to have to look at a variety of different things besides just zoning and amendments to the comp plan. Yeah. I was that uh, fourth guy sitting behind the podium <laughs> that uh, <laughs> left out of the, the quiet uh, guy. Oh, just, just, a, just a real quick comment. I, I lost eye contact with that guy. But, uh, you know, whenever you, whenever you tell somebody that uh, they can or cannot do something with their land, you risk what we call taking the land from them and also the economic value. Uh, with zoning uh, in the state of Illinois, of course we can we can uh, uh, we can enforce uh, land use decisions. Um, outside of outside of that, we also have the um, uh, power that was given to county executives and also county board chairman St. Clair County um, the right to seek uh, court relief and injunctions on decisions that have been made uh, by zoning boards. Uh, in municipalities. So as a, as a super government, we're able to uh, take a look at, at those decisions and um, uh, seek injunctive relief if we feel that those decisions are in the, uh, not in the best interest of the military. And I'd just like to leave you with an anecdote. Um, uh, we failed to do this, and um, a gun club that was located at the far end of uh, uh, the, the runway relocated within APZ2 and that gun club allows their members to not only shoot 45s and 22s, but also 50 millimeter weapons. When a heavy is coming down, that could take out an engine. So I'll leave you with that thought. Do you have one more question there, and then ma'am. Yes, uh, this, this question is specifically from Vincent Crowley. Now that you've had a success with the Naval Support Activity, uh, how can you translate that on taking on the challenge of doing the same thing for Tyndall? And is there an interest in doing that? Dan, is there an interest in doing that? Oh, well, uh, say, uh, you know, Tyndall is uh, not nominated at this point for a joint land use study. Um, however, you know, I think it's, it, the, the point is still uh, uh, salient, and that is that the relationships between the military installations and the local governments are always important, regardless of whether or not there is a, a nomination out there. And to, to answer your question, yes, there's, there's definite interest. Um, it, there have been rumors and talks uh, over the last, gosh, five years about possibly doing one with Tyndall. And I think Bay County and Panama City and Panama City Beach and the other cities around there uh, are definitely interested in trying to do that. Yep. Hi, this question is for the fourth speaker behind the podium. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Ivy Lewis from Prince George's County, Maryland, um, home of uh, Joint Base Andrews. We completed a joint land use study back in 2009 and are in the process of implementing it through an um, implementation committee. One of our biggest challenges is to uh, how to regulate land uses in the clear zone. We have industrial development, about 27 parcels in the northern clear zone of Andrews Air Force Base. The southern clear zone is wholly within the base, so we don't have that issue there. Did I hear you say that you actually have rec uh, regulations for the clear zone? Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, we do. Um, the, the regulations for the clear zone are spelled out in uh, the ACU study that was completed at Scott Air Force Base in 2008. What that does allow is for infrastructure improvements, uh, underground infrastructure as well as roadways, um, uh, those, those, kinds of, uh, uh, those kinds of improvements. Uh, we've also, uh, um, we also have, uh, have restricted any clear zone improvements uh, on the Scott side, once again, the military side, uh, we have we have uh, limited any kind of improvements, and we've referred back to the ACUS guidance on that, which is which is quite restrictive. Um, I know that at some military bases, Andrews used to be mine, by the way, at, at AMC. Uh, also, uh, if I recall correctly, at Andrews, uh, you had a housing development that was uh, just to the north of uh, of the flight line that was being demolished. 
uh, I think that some of, uh, some of that housing had been cleared out and that um, they were doing that uh, 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 for the purpose of, of uh, maintaining uh, uh, some semblance of safety at the edge of the runways. Uh, I do know that at other bases along the East Coast, and this is particularly uh, prevalent among, among the older bases, encroachment has come right up to the edge of, of the flight line. And that really poses a problem outside of the fences, of course, because uh, the APZs uh, uh, move uh, uh, well, well past the, the edge of the runway and also those fence lines. So, uh, But in APZ-1 and APZ-2, there is limited uh, potential for development. And again, we've uh, incorporated those, um, those compatible development uses uh, into the zoning ordinance, um, into the safety of the AO2 uh, uh, zone that we've uh, identified. Uh, by the way, the, the breaking up of AO 1, 2, 3, and 4 in our zoning code, in our airport overlay, really served us well to chunk up the ACUS guidance, which tends to be very, uh, very confusing to say the least. Uh, when you bring all of that uh, to bear in a matrix, it becomes very confusing, especially when you're limited to yeses and nos. So uh, for that purpose, we, uh, we uh, moved to different uh, airport overlay zones. Okay, thank so. you. Since we're bumping up against uh, the break now, I want to invite each of you, if you still have questions, you know, to approach the podium at the end of the session. But uh, I also want to take this time to thank you guys, all of the speakers today, for uh, providing us uh, some, some anecdotes and also some information about your experiences and your actions, your activities. And I want to thank you for attending today. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, that is very impressive. Yeah, we just stopped. I got to spin off the pressure from that last one real quick while yeah. I got.